And so the major objectives of the um, Science of the Noosphere project that we developed was to uh, first validate the concept of the noosphere um, from a modern scientific perspective, uh, to bring the concept of the noosphere to the attention of the scientific community, to communicate to a high level audience, and to gather foundational material for telling the third story to mass audiences. Before we tell it to the masses, we really need to establish a scientific foundation and tell it to the, uh, and tell it to the um, uh, experts. Now the initial conditions for this, and this I knew as a contemporary evolutionary scientist, is that Teilhard, although he was highly respected during his day, has been almost entirely forgotten by modern evolutionary scientists. They might know the name, but they don't really connect it. He's not quoted in the literature or anything um, uh, like that. And what this means is that most of the scientists that we chose for the relevance of their work uh, themselves knew little or nothing about Teilhard, with a few exceptions, and were not actively framing their work in terms of the noosphere. And so it was necessary to take Teilhard and to translate that into the vocabulary of the current scientists. And this really involves a kind of a bilinguality here. Um, what the scientists were talking about were concepts such as multi-level selection, major evolutionary transitions, and of course you're familiar with these, we've been using these terms here, and of course um, complex systems uh, science. And then we have Teilhard, his writing, and the concept of the noosphere and I think what we need is genuine bilinguality. In other words, we need to develop both of these strongly and then to be able to uh, have a strong link, uh, link between them. And I've been wanting to say some things based on, based on the conversation on the power of Teilhard's writing. Uh, on the one hand, we're saying that it's hard to understand. We need to develop quick versions. We need to have some kind of elevator speech to say what we're talking about. But on the other hand, when we were checking in at the very beginning of this day, quite a few people say that they were called to come here by Tehard. And Tehard has somehow become embedded in their minds, beginning with Ben. And I think it's so interesting to think that if you take the great wisdom traditions, such as Christianity or, or Buddhism, of course, these are very complicated bodies of knowledge. These are bodies of knowledge that you will never master in your lifetime, but they're so important to you that you want to think about them. They basically, they structure your, your, your thoughts and you want to spend time on them. And I think that that's, that's what we're seeking, I think, with the third story is not just introduce it quickly to people, but to introduce it into a way that it really does become the way that you view the world and which ultimately informs your actions. And if you look at this Google engram here, uh, on the frequency of word usage is what I've compared is Tehard with uh, three of the fathers of the modern synthesis. So these were scientists, Julian Huxley, Ernst Marr, and Theodosius Dobjansky. Uh, you might say that Marr and Dobjansky were second story scientists. They were basically doing the science. Uh, Julian Huxley actually was a bit of a third story scientist because he was a very active humanist. And the phenomenon of man, the introduction was by Julian Huxley, okay? And so Huxley was trying to do something different and more Teilhardian than, uh, than the second story scientists, Marr and Dobzhansky. But of course, Teilhard did it better than Huxley. And here we have the fact that he has actually kept alive in the minds of people more than the scientists and without any scientific connection. Why is it that he has read and loved all by himself without the support of modern science is because he actually managed to do, being, I think, a Jesuit priest, he knew how to create a, a meaning system, basically, that was highly motivational in the same way that the Christian meaning system is, but based on, on evolution. And so that narrative, even though it might t be difficult for some people to acquire, is something that we want to uh, uh, develop. When you look at all the problem people have in communicating evolution and evolution denial and you know when it's taught as just a second story, it's just not very interesting to, to people. Well, Teilhard actually succeeded and we really need to build upon what he, what he uh, 
uh, what he uh, uh, did. So, uh, okay, so the primary outputs of the project is, uh, in the first place, a target article that I wrote titled Reintroducing Teilhard uh, to Modern Evolutionary Science. This, uh, given the wonderful stately pace of scientific publishing, this is, uh, I'm about to receive the page proofs. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, and academic publishing is such a snail's pace uh, um, uh, a problem. But in a very good journal, this is the main journal for religion from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And then the series of 24 conversations um, with 30 top scientists and uh, intellectuals in a section of the uh, Human Energy website that makes this available as videos, print transcripts, and summaries. And I don't know if Alan is here. He's probably recording somebody right now. But I just wanted to praise Alan, our videographer, who spoke earlier today for his not just his wonderful work as a videographer, but he has developed a real professional level of knowledge about the major transitions in the science of the noosphere. So I regard him as a colleague and a friend, and I think it's, he's, he's made a wonderful contribution here, and I'm so glad that he's continuing with the, um, with the video uh, project. Uh, and so in the article introducing uh, Tehard, we needed to perform this translation. And here are the major themes, uh, how I kind of parsed Teilhard's writing in the, in, the, uh, um, in the chapter 10, and also more generally the uh, corpus of his work. First of all, of course, uh, he had a naturalistic view of uh, human evolution. Of course, he emphasized human cultural evolution. But the reason it's important to emphasize this is that what he was writing was just during the time that the so-called modern synthesis was being established. And the modern synthesis was highly gene-centric. This was a time in which the study of evolution became almost entirely restricted to the study of genetic evolution, and specifically Mendelian evolution, as it was understood at the time. And so I've taken to calling the modern synthesis the great constriction. So other than Teilhard, nobody was studying cultural evolution. And the serious study of cultural evolution did not resume until the 1970s with figures such as Peter Richardson and Rob Boyd and so on and so forth. Now the study of cultural evolution is in full swing. But back then, Teilhard was swimming absolutely against the tide as all of the rest of evolution was becoming gene-centric, as if the only way for offspring to resemble their parents was by sharing the same genes something which is patently false when you state it outright. But that's basically what the modern synthesis um, 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 amounted to. The idea that there's a thinking dimension of evolution, of course, is, a, is, a, is a central to Teilhard. But not only now can we say that absolutely right. I mean, um, um, absolutely. The whole concept of superorganisms and Major evolutionary transitions is something that uh, modern evolutionary science is catching up to Teilhard's vision, because back then we had the whole selfish gene era, a kind of reductionistic and individualistic era that we're now just coming out of. Uh, the idea of coalescence of human cultures. In uh, some of the passages of Teilhard that I love, he talks about tiny grains of thought, which then coalesce. And so the tiny grains of thought are small-scale human society which, instead of just diversifying, coalesce and become larger and larger um, and, um, and larger. The role of technology, of course, and the sanctity of the individual, which I think when we talk about the various dystopic forms of ultra-society, forms of superorganisms that we don't want, how do we need, how do we get a superorganism which actually also has the sanctity of the individual? And Teilhard spoke on that topic, so he's a guidepost for that, um, uh, uh, for that um, as well. And so the impact of this article is that, um, um, uh, so it, it appeared, here are the commentators. And so we see uh, some familiar names. We see Terry and Francis and Clement. Um, and then we see uh, uh, Celia Dean Drummond and Ilya Delio are theologians, but they're theologians that are very highly science friendly, and deep, deep Teilhard scholars. 
more than I'll ever be. <laughs> and so they had a really a deep knowledge of the whole corpus. They're theological, but in a way which is a kind that we can appreciate. And like Tehard, this was a kind of a process-based theology which is, which is really founded upon modern science. And so for them to become part of the conversation, I think is important. I think that this, that human energy needs to be reaching out to all of the Tehard associations, even those that are kind of more on the spiritual and theological end, in addition to the scientific um, end. And I have a podcast with Ilya Delio and uh, her granddaughter. She does a podcast with her, herself and her granddaughter that was a lot of fun, a 14-year-old grand, uh, granddaughter, and I think that's on their website. Um, Michael Price is, a, is an evolutionary psychologist with an interest in religion, and then uh, and so uh, that's a, uh, those who wrote uh, uh, our commentaries. And so what we've done is we've succeeded in reintroducing Teilhard to the modern evolutionary science communities. Uh, we've engaged science-oriented theologists, um, and uh, we've featured uh, human energy and its scientific personnel as important um, uh, people in the, uh, in the conversation. So for the 24, our conversations, uh, uh, one point to make about them is that they represent the full sweep of Tehard's vision. One of the reasons that Tehard is so um, uh, awe-inspiring in his, in his uh, evolutionary cosmology is that he asks us to imagine the Earth before life. And then he asks us to imagine the, the origin of life and the spreading of life around the Earth as a kind of a skin which becomes the bio um, a sphere, and then the emergence of humans, which in some ways are just another species, but in other ways are a new evolutionary process, therefore as important in its own way as the origin of life. And then he imagines us to imagine the bushy tree of life growing slowly, and on one twig something happens, and then quickly that twig proliferates so rapidly that it almost over, overreaches the whole, the whole uh, tree all the way up to the present. And so that really requires the whole sweep for our uh, conversations here, starting with the origin of life all the way up to the present. And we succeeded at doing that thanks to uh, Terry and Ursa Swathmary, who is one of the first people who, who developed the concept of major evolutionary transitions. And so in the interest of, um, of um, time, I'm not going to go through this in two details, but what you can see here is we start at the origin of life. Such wonderful material on, uh, on single cells and uh, the nature of cancer as basically a form of cheating behavior in multicellular organisms. So it's a selection within uh, cells. Uh, laboratory experiments on the evolutionary multi, multi uh, 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 cellularity, and then uh, one on uh, insect uh, superorganisms, Deborah Gordon, whose uh, work is wonderful. Now we move into, uh, into human evolution, and with, with some of the major people there, Leslie Newson and Peter uh, uh, Richardson. Really proud that we included an indigenous voice here on indigenous societies. Tyson Yunkaporta is well known for his book, uh, Sand Talk, about how indigenous wisdom can change um, the, uh, uh, the world, and so that was uh, really cool to include uh, him and his wife, Megan. And then there's James Cohen and, uh, and Gary Steinberg on human group psychology, including, including uh, social baseline theory, which I just mentioned. And I think the important point to make here is that when we talk about a group mind, that's something that, that, that evolved at the very beginning at the, at the scale of small-scale human society. And if you go back to uh, the field of social psychology a, a hundred years ago, what you find is it was very comfortable with the idea of group mentality. And if you look at the basic cognitive abilities of perception, what we actually perceive, memory, how we memorize things, decision making, how we make decisions, all of those are fundamentally group processes, fundamentally group processes. The only way that we remember is by knowing who else has the information and how to get to them. Memory is definitely a group distributed process. Decision making almost never takes place in 
isolation. And what we see and don't see, don't see is very much a social process. And then, of course, the capacity for symbolic thought is inherently a community activity. There's not a single important cognitive process that you can name that is not a group process from the very beginning. And so the idea that at the very beginning of our species, we were group level superorganisms only at a small scale. And so the noosphere, what the process has been, has been an expansion of the noosphere. But the noosphere was there from the very beginning. That's what it means for us to be an ultra cooperative species. It was there from the very beginning as those tiny grains of thought was tiny noospheres. And then there's been an expansion, which is still, which is still um, um, uh, in progress. An amazing interview with jo uh, Josh Ober, Stanford classicist and political scientist on, on um, uh, the origin of democracy in classical Greece as, as a process of multi-level selection. He actually, he's a colleague of Deborah Gordon's, who's also at Stanford. And so he talks about the, 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 the Greek city-states, the polis, as like ant colonies, as like ant colonies, and the intense selection among city-states, both economically and in warfare, and the deliberative, intentional fashion in which Athens, for instance, implemented social structures so that the, so that the society could function at the level of the whole city-state as opposed to smaller entities. That, in, that involved the, the, the invention of entire tribes that were called tribes that had no historical precedent, basically groupings that were created out of whole cloth with the express purpose of creating a kind of a social physiology for the social organism at that, uh, at that uh, level. Just amazing to have what, of course, is something which is um, and this is true for all scholarship. Uh, if you look at the amount of scholarship on like Christianity or, or Buddhism or, or the Greek period or so on, I mean, it is vast. And it's amazing the detail, the empirical detail that's known about what happened um, uh, back, back then. But to, in, to interpret it from this theoretical perspective as a process of multi-level cultural evolution, that's what's uh, that's what's new, and it's just an entirely new interpretive framework, which is so exciting. And that also goes for Peter Turchin and Darren Esamoglu for the last 10,000 years of human history, we can view as this expansion of scale from uh, multi-level cultural, uh, uh, cultural evolution. And all of these, we were very careful to make sure that when we speak to these people about their specialties, which might be single cells or the origin of life or or, or an ancient period, that we ask them also to speculate or to talk on uh, the future of the internet. So we're not waiting until the later conversations in order to get to the main event. But we're asking everyone about, about their insights onto the, um, uh, to basically a future orient orientation. And so, um, uh, so there's uh, Gregory. <laughs> And Clement, Francis, Shima, people here, Michael. And so uh, it goes on and on and um, uh, uh, on. OK, so to reflect upon what we have done, uh, first of all, each of these conversations is very uh, deep dive. We did not spare the, the um, uh, uh, details, not dumbed down. And, any sense. Uh, the people we chose were just absolutely tops in their field, and so I think we can declare in some ways mission accomplished for placing the concept of the noosphere in a modern scientific foundations. We showcased our own scientific associates uh, and uh, so on. I think for me it was a great way to facilitate communication among the human energy associates. And Ben, you've talked about the kind of a, 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 little, a bit more siloing than than we want, but this was my opportunity to actually you know, have an in-depth interview with all of the scientific people supported by, by um, human energy, and so that was, uh, that was great. Uh, beautifully produced, thanks to Alan and all the support that he got, so I'm very proud to send people to that section of the human energy um, uh, website. It needs to be made more accessible to a mass audience, and that's Alan's current project that he reported on this morning, and 
in its current form uh, would make an excellent curriculum for a master class, and I'm going to get to that in just a, uh, in just a minute. Uh, last time I talked to this audience, I, I presented this slide and the concept of um, science to narrative chain, which seemed to, uh, to resonate. And so what this means is that what we need, of course, we need science on the left, scientific research and academic publications. On the right, we need our motivating stories reaching mass audiences, but those need to be connected to each other by a chain of material that provides intermediate depth. So that no matter where you start out on the chain, there's always that you can learn more. You, you're provided with the resources to learn more and more uh, and more. And so I see the science of the Noosphere project as operating on the science end of the science to narrative chain. And for our various communication projects, including Alan's to be on the, on the right end and human energy spanning the whole, um, the whole scale. Okay, so that brings us up to the present. And so what's next? Uh, we've been asked to form a Track B Science Committee and we met for the first time uh, uh, yesterday. And so we're organizing a framework for ongoing interactions. And this is of course all just beginning, but here are some foci that are emerging. And then again, we've heard that uh, 2023 is the 100th anniversary of the word noosphere. And if we don't make hay out of that, then uh, and uh, we're not storytellers at all. So we really need to make 2023 the year of the, uh, uh, the noosphere. And I think that one way to do this, what to do during the course of the year, is uh, early on, like right away, um, I create a master class, which I'm about to talk about, based on the video conversations. Uh, late in the year, let's have a major conference, which is not just a science conference, science plus more, conference. Let's plan that for late in the year. And then the mid-year, enough about youth already. We need to reach current thought leaders and change agents, youth plus more. But we need to reach CEOs, tech giants, entrepreneurs, politicians, sustainability movement, public intellectuals, professors, grad students, artists. We need to reach the current generation of adult leaders in addition to um, uh, youth. And as an example of that, uh, earlier this year I attended a, a gathering called Emerge in Austin, Texas, a worldwide gathering. It's the first time they met in the United States. And this was like 200 people like the ones I was, I was describing. Here's a small sample of the people that were there. We already mentioned Tristan Harris um, as, uh, in his uh, Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, his podcast, You're Undivided attention as somebody who is really raising the alarm about the current dysfunction of the mass uh, media and trying to do something, uh, trying to do something about it. Uh, he was there. Uh, here's Jeremy Lent. I don't know how many of you know about Jeremy Lent, but he's a uh, public intellectual, uh, written two great books, The Web of Meaning and The Patterning Instinct. Um, his uh, next book is on the identifying the principles of an ecological civilization. He actually did an online seminar for us, and so uh, I can link to that seminar, Identifying the Principles of an Ecological uh, Civilization. He's built a community um, around his books, a, a following. It's, he calls it the Deep Transformation Network. It's on Mighty Networks, if you know that community uh, platform. I think well over a thousand people that are basically following him and interacting, and so he was at the Emerge uh, uh, conference. Here we have Fernanda Ibera and Arthur Brock, who are, are leaders in, uh, in uh, alternative currencies and blockchains and all of those great things. Very much the superorganism. They led a workshop on the superorganism at the Emerge conference, but they knew little about Tehard, not much about the, the science of, of, not much about multi-level selection theory. And of course, we were eager to get together. Uh, their organization is called the Commons Engine, uh, Creative Living uh, Economies for uh, Thrivability. And uh, um, uh, Fernanda just did an online seminar for us. So you can listen to that recording very soon. And it was just wonderful what she means by alternative currencies. It's not just like, don't think Bitcoin or, or anything that's like an alternative money. This is something which has multiple forms of capital. Um, and it was, um, it was inspirational to hear, uh, uh, to, uh, to hear her. Well, imagine 200 people like this. 
that are all doing things that are kind of in parallel to what we're trying to, to do. And so these people were as smart, well-connected, and well-informed as you can possibly imagine. Multiple forms of capital, including very innovative funding models, have more and more an idea that we need to be funding whole you know, regional projects, not just single foundations and things like that. We need to be funding at some kind of a systemic level and crowdfunding and, and all kinds of innovative funding um, models. All of them oriented towards the welfare of the whole uh, world. Uh, quite literate about complex system science and it's uh, certainly adopted its language. Uh, the Emerge Gathering was, was, was called the third attractor was that they were working towards and so the idea of at least they had the lingo of complex system science. But um, um, uh, capable and eager to geek out on complex material, for them the science of the noosphere videos would be no, just mind candy. No problem at all, but that, that's the kind of thing they're kind of, uh, they're kind of um, uh, seeking. And yet, despite all of that, very largely lacking in rigorous scientific uh, um, expertise. I was almost literally the only person there that reflected that degree of scientific, represented by myself and people like Terry, Terry Deacon, and newly encountering the material presented in the science of the noosphere series. Even though they were so open-minded and well-read in other respects, this material is so new, so new, it simply has not been encountered. Has not been encountered. And when it is, there's no hesitation at all. So it's, it's really a matter of encountering. We need to get this material out there and present this material in front of exceptionally talented and prepared people in order to, um, in order to uh, uh, to use it, and that's what a master class would, would do. We already have the curriculum. We've done that. Now how do we get it out there into this amazing audience of people? We need to recruit a diverse audience to embark upon some kind of learning to action journey. Uh, this involves viewing and discussing the videos, of course, but let's do it in a non-linear fashion. It's not just like for first one, second one, so on. Let's do something where you actually have a choice and then we form groups that form around, so make it more of a co-created um, uh, process. Um, uh, uh, sh a short on polish. We don't need to do polish here. We just need to get a framework for to get people interacting, which on the internet is not hard um, at all. And then we can prototype it for repeated um, offerings. This can be very low cost. Um, uh, project need not cost a lot of money. A little bit of assistance is all that's uh, uh, this needed. I think it could be organized to start right away, and it could be started in January, as far as I'm concerned, 2023, to kick off the year of the uh, of the um, uh, noosphere. Uh, for an event at the end, I'm going to say almost nothing about it except that uh, uh, my friend and colleague at uh, Pro Social World, Jeff Janong, likes to say that we need to build something that's like a chair with four sturdy legs, and those legs are science, technology, spirituality, and the arts. And especially the arts, I think, is the, is the one that's in shortest supply, but it's the one that's in many ways is most, most important. So I would love to have an event, to organize an event that really does represent all four of these things. And of course, that would make it ever much more fun than a, um, a, uh, just a science conference. And so science conference plus more, I would love to work towards something like that. And then finally, when it comes to implementing the noosphere uh, uh, concept, what that means is working in real world settings to help groups become more cooperative and adaptable, all contexts, all scales, from villages to the global village. And this is where my nonprofit organization, Pro Social World, I think is, is, um, has taken the lead, I might say, and it's eager to partner with, um, with, uh, with human uh, energy. Um, what we've done is we've developed over the years a team of team approaches. It's itself a multi-level framework for working with partnering organizations in which individuals, level one, uh, form teams, level two, representing organizations, level three, uh, that expect to work with each other, level four. And the interactions are ongoing because cultural evolution is an ongoing process. This is not some kind of in and out training. This is something which we want to be, take place in, 
in perpetuity. And as soon as you set up this team of teams frameworks, you've actually set up a population structure for multi-level cultural evolution almost before the specifics of what gets talked about. Because if these organizations start just talking to each other through this mechanism, they're actually sharing ideas and adopting them and a kind of a native process of cultural evolution is already taking place uh, before you add more formal, uh, formal material. And we've developed this through a number of funded projects. And here I'm, I'm acknowledging our, uh, the need of human energy to basically develop and to put this on a, on a platform of where you're just not paying all of the, of the revenues. And so uh, here's some funded projects from pro-social world. We started in the uh, United Kingdom with a, a grant funded by the Economic and Social Research Council with the sustainability focus. And some of the organizations, our team of team organizations, included the Donut Economics Action Lab, uh, Scotland's United Health Service. So we have a wonderful health story to, to uh, how to share the Bristol school system. This is showing you that there's different um, um, in all contexts. Then we got a grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation. There's three Templeton foundations, and that's one of them to work in, uh, in Latin America. We started out with eight organizations with very different topic foci. And even during the first year, it's almost doubled. And we expect that to have a real um, elbow in the, um, um, in the coming a year. Here's a project in the Midwest um, on regenerative agriculture. How do we have fundamental change in, in agriculture in the Midwest so that we have perennial crops so we're not tilling the ground all the time? And how do we do that? How do we build a supply chain uh, around that? And so this is really the evolution of a whole complex system that is, uh, uh, that is required. And then we have um, a new grant, a major grant from the John Templeton Foundation to develop this approach. We call it the field side approach for studying, that's basic scientific research, and stewarding positive change efforts with a number of focal topic um, um, areas. And so that's where we stand now. And uh, I really look forward for working with Human Energy, um, our organization, and many other organizations, because we can't build the noosphere, of course, without being richly connected to other uh, organizations, as this lovely diagram of polycentric governance uh, illustrates. So thank you very much.